repairing to live stream. Zoom is connecting to YouTube. Okay, we are live on YouTube and I'm going to broadcast now. 1029, uh, broadcasting now. So we'll just wait for a few minutes. Let the attendees join. Mm. Attendees are joining. We have uh, over 80 okay. and yeah. counting. And countdown three to one, over to you, Sir Jacob. Okay. Hello, I am Jacob Schiller, uh, Assistant Professor in the Department of English at St. Anthony's College. And I have the privilege of hosting this webinar on faculty development organized by the Department of Value Education, St. Anthony's College, as part of the Don Bosco Higher Education Network Consortium. Um, attendees, please know that we will be, we are also live streaming this um, on YouTube. You can go over to the link youtube.com uh, slash uh, small c uh, slash value education, that is uh, capital V A L U E. Then capital E education. So uh, we are going. To, we are live streaming this, uh, streaming this at uh, YouTube.com/c/ value education, and you can take a look at the chat box. You'll find the link there if you want to send it to anybody or if you want to go live on uh, YouTube. So a warm good morning to our distinguished uh, speakers, which are Professor Timothy Suba, Professor Rajnike Chetri, Professor Rosemary Isharari, and Reverend Father Saji Stephen P. Um, as team heads of institutions forming the consortium, I would like to mention and acknowledge the, 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 the following names, Reverend Father George Principal, Salation College Sonada and Siliguri, Reverend Father Francis Gay, uh, Principal Don Bosco Arts and Science College, Anganwadi Kadavu, Kerala, Reverend Father jo uh, Jose George, Don Bosco College, Itanagar, Arunachal Pradesh, Reverend Father Maria Antoni, Principal Sacred Heart College, Tirapatur, Tamil uh, Nadu, Reverend Father Thaddeus, Thaddeus, Principal Don Bosco College, Yelangir, Tamil Nadu. Reverend Brother Albert L. Dakar, Principal, St. Anthony's College, Shillong, Meghalaya. My apologies for mispronouncing some of the names. Um, and I'll, I would also like to uh, wish a warm good morning to the members of the organizing team and of the technical team, Reverend Father Dr. Joby Joseph, uh, Rector, St. Anthony's College, Head, Department of Value Education, Professor Nathaniel N. Majau, Department of Mass Media, Mr. Bablu Rajak, Systems Administrator, and all of you are valued uh, participants. Before we begin our webinar, uh, we would like to invite uh, Reverend Father Joby Joseph to kindly lead us in a word of prayer. Okay, let's place ourselves in the presence of God, Father, Son, and the Spirit. We turn to the Lord today as we begin this webinar on faculty enrichment, core issues in our profession as teachers. We listen to a reading from the Holy Scripture, from the book, the Gospel of St. John, chapter 14. The Lord Jesus tells us, peace, I live with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid for I am with you till the end of time. As the Lord assures us peace, we want to pray for this gift of peace as teachers, as educators, as members of the family, as members of the community, society, that we experience deep in us divine peace so that we are able to give this peace to our educants, our students, our youngsters, and wherever we are. We listen to a prayerful song 
the song of St. Francis of Assisi, praying and asking, Lord, make us an instrument of your peace. Father, we ask you to make us all instruments of your peace, peace within and peace to the world around. In your precious name, Lord, we pray. Amen. Thank you, Father, for that uh, very warm prayer that we have had this morning before we start. Um, allow me to give an introduction to the three organizations under whose aegis this webinar is being organized. RUS, or the Institutione Salesiane di Eclusian, the Educazione Superiore, or the Salesian Institutions of Higher Education, also known as the Instituto Universitatis Salesianum, is the global network of Salesian institutions located in Rome, Italy. The Salesian World um, Headquarters. It has branches in 132 countries in the world. In India, IUS is present in the form of the Don Bosco Higher Education of India, DBHEI. There are more than 50 different institutions, uh, higher educational institutions, which are part of the DBHEI. The type of higher education institutions include university, engineering, and polytechnic colleges, agricultural colleges, arts and uh, science colleges, colleges of education, special institutes like printing, media, etc. The Don Bosco Higher Education Network Consortium came into existence with the signing of an MOU among six different Catholic institutions of higher education, which includes Salation College, Sonata Saliguri, Don Bosco Arts and Science College, Angadi Kadavu, Kerala, 
Don Bosco College, Itanagar, Arunachal Pradesh. Sacred Heart College, Tirupattur, Tamil Nadu. Don Bosco College, Yelagir, um, Yelagir, uh, Yelagiri, Tamil Nadu. St. Anthony's College, Shillong, Meghalaya. So these are the different colleges and the, the different organizations that have brought this webinar to, uh, to you today. Uh, we are going to have four different sessions as highlighted. I will very briefly introduce each of our distinguished speakers to you, after which they will come online one after the other to give their talk and their presentations. Uh, Mr. Timothy Suba is, an, uh, is a, as an associate professor, retired as the head of the Department of English, St. Anthony's College, Shillong having served the institution for over 30 years. He is currently teaching at the St. Anthony's College Extension College in Bindihati. Ms. Rajni K. Chetri is an assistant professor in the Department of Mass Media at St. Anthony's College. She is currently working on her doctoral dissertation at the Assam Don Bosco University, Guwahati. Ms. Rosemary Ishwarari is an assistant professor in the Department of Mass Media, St. Anthony's College, Shillong. Uh, Reverend Father Saji Stephen B was formerly the head of the Department of Value Education at St. Anthony's College, Shillong. He has also been the rector of the college community here. He is currently the rector of the Don Bosco Nongakiat. So these are the four speakers that we have been able to bring to you. And we would now like to, um, uh, we will be going over to them online and they'll be giving their presentation and their talks. But before we go there, I have some housekeeping to do and uh, to give you some information before we begin uh, with our uh, speakers. Now, please note that each of the speakers will be speaking for 30 minutes each, and, but uh, we will not be able to receive questions directly to them. You can mail your questions to, uh, to this address, VED, VED, VEDU, sorry, VEDU, VEDU at anthonys.ac.in. Please mail your questions to VEDU at anthonys.ac.in. We will take your questions, but please remember to uh, give the name of the speaker you are directing the question to, and also please mention your name and your designation. Now you can see it online. You can see it on the screen. That is the email, email address. We will also be having a feedback form that you need to submit uh, if you want a certificate. So if you submit your certificate, if you want your, if you want your certificate, you can kindly submit your feedback forms. At the end of uh, the, the presentation, at the end of the webinar, we will be sending you this link. Uh, and again, you can write, uh, you can fill in your feedback and you can send it to us. We will send you a certificate immediately. So again, please send your questions to vedu at anthony.ac.in. Uh, please mention, don't forget to mention the name of the speaker that you're directing the question to. Um, so uh, that's enough talk from me. Uh, now I now have the honor of inviting Mr. Timothy Suba, our first speaker to come online and to give his presentation. Over to you, sir. Sir, please unmute yourself, sir. It's okay? Yes, sir. All right. Uh, the topic of the discourse this morning is teaching communicative English to second language learners. Now, first of all, we have to understand the communication process. There are two distinct features in this communication process. One is implosion, bits and pieces of information trickling in from various sources to our one source that choose on them to make a single sense. That is gathering the information. And second is the explosion, which is one piece of information fanning outward from one source to many. Now these two are both intricately connected and work together to make a single whole sense. In a formula, formalized delivery, be it in writing or speech or presentation, you need to have more information than your subject matter, which you also have to collate. Now, there are certain facts you need to know. There are four of them. The first is your audience and their knowledge and interest levels. The second, the medium and location you are delivering in. 
the third, the reason why you are delivering whatever you plan to deliver. And fourth, the result or results that you hope to garner. Now, all these four will have to consummate while you are making the communication effort towards the young learners. Now, as we all understand that language is the medium of communication, therefore, our language must be able to communicate thoughts, ideas, knowledge to our listeners. English being a second language to all the non-native speakers of English, there is always a constant interference of our mother tongue while learning or speaking English. When we live in a certain language environment, there is always a hurdle in the process of our learning and teaching English. Now, as we look upon it, there are certain errors that we detect in our written as well as in our spoken English. Now, there are very many of these errors, but due to the paucity of time, I have selected only a few of them, which would be of some use. The first is the use of I and me. For example, you can see it on the screen. John and me will meet at 10 a.m. on Thursday is an erroneous statement. You must use I when you do something. For example, I do the job. And you must use me when something is done to or for you. For example, the job was done for me. Now, the second error is the use of who or whom. This is a very constant hurdle that people come across. But we must understand that you must be able to use who when he, she, they, I, or we could replace the who in the answer. I will give you an example. Who asked you the question? They asked me the question. So who is being replaced by they? Now the second is used whom, when we, him, her, them, me, or us could replace the whom in the answer. For example, whom did you select to represent the company? I selected him to represent the company. So the usage of who and whom become very paramount whenever we are talking in a certain context. Now, the next I would like to point here is uh, the confusion between more and most, which is of course a common error for us Indian speakers of English. The example that I'm giving out here is Richard is the more competent of the five candidates we interviewed for the project. More is a wrong comparative degree in this particular sentence. We must use the comparative form only when we are referring to two persons, places or things. And the superlative form when we refer to more than, to three or more. In this particular sentence, it must read that Richard is the most competent because we have five candidates there. The next one that I'd like to put before you is the agreement of the verb with the subject. This again is a very common error that we come across Indian speakers of English. The sentence, as you can see, the new mix of technology classes look interesting. Actually, the verb look must agree in number with the subject, which is mix and it is not classes. Many of us make a mistake there and we use the plural form of the verb look. Here, since mix is a singular subject, so the, it requires a singular verb 
looks. The next one I would like to point out is the confusion in adding ST, ND, or TH to the dates of the month. I give you the sentence again there. The managing director will introduce himself to the new employees on Friday, December 12th. Again, the word 12th is wrongly placed there. When the day follows the month, we must use the numerical. We should not add ST, ND, or TH to the number. Therefore, this sentence is incorrect. When the day precedes the month, then you can write it in either a numerical, like first, second, third, or fourth, or even use the words of first, second, third, fourth. So this particular sentence, since the day follows the month, therefore, it must read as December 12th and not 12th. I now go to the next important segment of our discourse, and that is the interference of the mother tongue while learning the second language, which here, of course, is English. We always tend to use rhyming words in a sentence. I would like to draw your attention to these sentences here. The first one is, I saw him bickering and dickering with a salesman. The word dicker rhymes with bicker. Therefore, we use these rhyming indiscriminately, which is wrong. The word dicker in this context means to bargain, which is appropriate. But bicker, which means to argue or to complain, is actually uncalled for in this situation. So we have to use the word bickering only and not dickering. Sorry, dickering only and not bickering. Now, the next sentence uh, is, uh, the next uh, error is the use of superfluous words in a sentence. Or oh, before that, I would like to go to the word again, fooding and lodging. Again, is a very, very common error. Fooding and lodging will be provided to the participants. There is no such word in English as fooding. It will always have to be food and lodging. Uh, now I go to the next error, which is using superfluous words in a sentence, which means a word which does not have any meaning whatsoever. The sentence that I'd like to give you is, I have great difficulty in coping up with the work. The word up is used in a complete superfluous way. It should be coping with and not coping up with. The next sentence, again, is a superfluous word. Last Saturday, Mary invited the departmental, visited, sorry, visited, visited the departmental store. Here, the word should be department store, which speaks of different departments of the store. The word departmental pertains to a particular department. For example, this is a departmental problem in the finance ministry. There is yet another sentence that I'd like to draw your attention. The bureaucrats are to be blamed for the red tapism in the implementation of government policies. To be blamed is a wrong expression. It should be to blame. The bureaucrats are to blame. The word be there is superfluous. Then I would like to go on to the next one, which is the use and misuse of the prepositions. The sentence is, I think right now he is in the flight to Paris. The preposition in is wrong in this context. It should be on. So we read it as, I think right now he is on the flight to Paris. Just as we say, he is on the ship. The next one we will go now to would be the writing formation. In the writing formation, we have several points there. First of all, a piece of writing needs to be 
a single unitary piece of composition, no matter how many words or paragraphs it may contain. Second, there needs to be a unifying thread that holds the writing together. Third, it needs to make sense to those it targets, so must be presented in a style and format suitable for them. Here, I would like to add that this is where we have to understand our target audience to who we are addressing. The next one, the whole piece of writing must follow an idea and a flow that puts it across as one piece of communication. In other words, it should not be disjointed, but must have a sequential flow of the thought that is expressed in a piece of communication. Then I would like to go on to the corpus that is there of any writing should have three distinct parts. Uh, I think we are quite familiar with this. That is the body, uh, sorry, the beginning, the body and the conclusion. It is to be noted that the opening line or the paragraph is always the toughest, but it must always strike the keynote of your entire written piece. Just like in a musical composition, the one who is playing on the musical instrument must strike the keynote to the musical piece. The same goes with the writing. The next, it will either draw the reader or the writing fails to be read if we are not able to strike the keynote. The third is getting it right is always half the battle won. Next one, mind your language. Write comfortably, avoid flowery delivery, which I believe most of us Indians are guilty of. We tend to make our sentences very cumbersome with highly ornamented language. We should try to avoid that. The last point here is get to the subject straight away, unless you start with an interesting anecdote or a quote to get your subject across. We go on to the body. Now, the question that we need to ask is, are your points ready? The next, when the points are ready, the copy of the written form must flow easily, logically, and seamlessly. In other words, there should be no disruption in your communication. The third is the writing must be compact and not loosely uh, woven. The next would be that most of the writing must follow a cause effect sequence, unless the writing is questioning a situation. In this case, of course, it must follow the effect cause sequence. Then there is the paragraphs should not be too lengthy. Should it be connected with each taking up the next sequence in the flow? So all of these go to point that our writing must have a very composite, seamless, and yet a one single unifying thought expressed in our written communication. Then we come to the conclusion. The conclusion primarily are of three kinds. The first is called the QED. It is clean and close-ended. QED will remind us of uh, the QED that we use in a theorem in a geometry. Of course, it is a, it is a, there is a Latin abbreviation, which of course means thus it is proved. So our conclusion must be clean. It must be close-ended. Sometimes you ha can have the question mark, which is an open-ended. Though sometimes it is not advisable, but sometimes it becomes unavoidable, but it becomes even good if it will bring in some sort of a debate. The third, of course, which we must uh, completely avoid, and that is to have a vague ending or even banal. The word banal means commonplace. Vague happens, vagueness happens when the lines uh, do not add up to the write up. Banal, when you use cliched styles such as in conclusion or in the final analysis, which is quite unnecessary. So therefore we have to avoid such kinds of conclusion. Are now 
I would like to go on to the next one, which is the art of writing. There are several points again here, which we must follow. The first is this, putting feeling into the writing always draws involvement. We must make, it, make an effort to involve ourselves and also the reader or the recipient as far as our writing is concerned. So therefore the next uh, point immediately follows and that is use of one in place of I, unless it is an absolutely personal communication. Then again, the use of you can also make your writing very inclusive, that you include the person whom you are addressing to. Then there is of course the treatment of target audience. This is very important. Uh, otherwise, you're going to lose uh, the essence of your whole writing. You must have self-assurance when you write. This should be reflected in our writings. It is like actually telling a story, uh, which will be arresting and it will generate interest in our listeners and our readers. Then we have the next one, and that is, as a rule, keep your sentences short and simple. Uh, there is a famous saying, says brevity is the soul of wit. So therefore, uh, here I, will have, I have some points here to uh, illustrate. First is active versus passive uh, sentences forms, sentence forms. The first is the sentence that is there in front is that there is a significant advantage in working slower, working slower, fewer mistakes. Now this is actually a passive sentence. To make it effective, it is always good to use active sentences and that is how it must go like, working slower results in fewer mistakes. This is a very good example of what you call weak English and strong English. Both the sentences are grammatically correct, but it will have its emphasis when you use more of the active than the passive sentences in your writing. The next is, of course, a repetition of phrase is always a bad form. Please look at the sentence that is there. The course of action actually has been repeated a number of times, a couple of times. Actually, it should be avoided. It should read, uh, deciding on his course of action to defeat the evil intent of Gaspar the wolf, Winnie the Pooh sat down and wrote his action plan out so that he would not be confused in it. The next one, of course, is that sometimes repetition of a word in a sentence can be good since the word creates emphasis. Again, look at the sentence. It has four words that are confused. That shows about the confusion of both the executive and the one who is receiving the letter. This is a good form of writing because it does give a lot of emphasis uh, to the whole intent of the writing. At the next point, I would like to make some certain suggestions for teachers. I believe most of us here are teachers and which not necessarily be teachers of English, but teachers in general. There are certain things that we need to remember. The first is called fogging. What does that mean? It means ask question to encourage expression. Unless you ask, you'll not be able to get the feedback. So that is important and you shouldn't be afraid of questions being asked. Second, listen to the context, the feeling, the point of view. Here is where you have to have the human face to be able to uh, be patient, to listen to the point of views of others as well. Then the second point is assertive inquiry. Ask questions to get more information. Second, allow a focus to appear. And third is to summarize the point of view. The next one is setting limits. And what does that mean? State what you are willing to do. Be courteous, exact and clear. We cannot afford to be vague and nebulous in this matter. The next one, which of course is very important here, is that that we are in a world where we face a lot of criticism many a time. 
And uh, many of us have been recipients of that, I believe. But how to handle criticism and that too effectively? Now, here are some of the simple rules that may help uh, each one of us to handle criticism. First of all, listen to what is being said, not what you think is being said. This is very important. Many times we have our own preconceived notions of what others have spoken and not really given a thought to. So therefore, the catch word there is listen. The second is ask questions to be sure you fully understand the comment. Many times arguments de uh, develop uh, because we do not really understand the comments being made by people. The third, of course, is a very important point that is decide if there really is an element of criticism, not just an expression of an opinion. It is sometimes useful uh, to restate the comment before deciding on your response. So the thought must go there. So the three catch words, uh, listen, ask, and decide. The next point that I'd like to put before you is stay calm and objective. You have to be calm. You should not lose your objective. And then only you will be able to become a good communicator. Then next one is comment. If it is a comment that is being made, um, acknowledge the person who is making that comment without necessarily agreeing with it. By you can just say, well, that comment is interesting, or I've never thought of it that way. Or you can say that certainly is another point of view. You can go in a very courteous way and not you know, indulge into verbose and uh, articulate arguments. The next, of course, is criticism. If it is a criticism, you must handle it and handle it tactfully by uh, coming out with such phraseology as, I could understand why you feel that way. It is true and uh, that I might have made some error. Your opinion is useful. Things like that, you can always uh, handle it accordingly. And last and very important is do not get into an argument because argument will only beget argument. I hope these points will be useful in our course of communication and communicating to our listeners, to our learners. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sir Timothy. Um, you have finished way ahead of time. And so we have five more minutes. In the meantime, I can um, send this out to all our attendees. If you have any questions for Professor Timothy Suba, you can kindly email them to vedu at anthony.ac.in. And, and once again, I would like to request you, please wait until the end of the fourth speaker before filling in your feedback forms. And we also have one, we also have a very important um, presentation from the principal of uh, Anthony's College, St. Anthony's College. So please wait for that also uh, towards the end of the session. I would now like to invite uh, Ms. Rajani K. Chetri to kindly come online to give her presentation. Over to you, ma'am. Hi, am I coming loud, clear? Am yes. I audible? Yes, you are. Okay. Please go okay, ahead. Okay, we're, we're ready to start. Okay, I'll just share my screen. Um, just give me a moment. Okay, so we are here. Do you see the screen now? Is it coming through, Sir Jacob? Uh, okay. Uh, okay, a very good morning to all of you who have joined us for this webinar today. And uh, I would like to thank the organizing team of the college for giving me this wonderful opportunity to speak on one of the most pertinent aspects, and that is digital media lit literacy. I've recently concluded uh, writing my PhD thesis on social media and collective identities, wherein I have attempted to study human group behavior by observing what they collectively do in an online space 
And I'm telling you, it has been a fascinating experience as it has revealed to me how our online behaviors mirrors the practices of our daily life and reveals a lot about our personality. So this webinar is designed on sharing some of the insights that I have gained through my study. One thing that we have in abundance in the recent time is definitely information. Uh, we are surrounded uh, by information. And I think the right word that uh, we can use is we are rather drowning in information. Take for example, like I've lost the count of several government direct directives that have emerged as a Corona bulletin. You know, I personally feel that we are living in an information pandemic and we really need some A skills to make sense of these informations that trails us. So information society is actually the hallmark of the 21st century living. At the very outset, let me be very categorical and bust away your myth. That is if you have any where, uh, which hints that I will be talking about the new emerging digital technologies, then I'm really sorry, that's not what my objective is. I'm rather here to raise some questions and maybe make you feel a little uncomfortable. So I do not wish to emphasize on technical aspect as I find it is quite transient, the pace at which the technology is progressing and the apps are emerging daily, it will not take too long for any knowledge on technology to be outdated. So my focus here today is to um, look into how do we make meaningful inferences of information that is flowing to us 24 by seven and as educators, what critical framework will come handy, uh, not just to understand our own digital consumption, but also to understand our students who live their life on the digital space. So let us begin by gaining an understanding of what is digital media. Now, in the, I believe that uh, we have participants from all field here. So in its very, very simplest understanding, digital media means digitized content. Basically, we're talking about the binaries of zeros and ones, and that can be shared in the internet or through the computer networks. Now, when we talk about digital media, there's a whole array of units that falls under digital media. And some of the key concerns that this talk aims to address is with regard to social media and digital data. Looking back into the history of digital media, it dates back to about six decades ago, it was in the 1960s and early 70s, computing power was well, uh, you know, increasing, the functionality was increasing. And uh, actually the period post 1990s and particularly around the millennium saw a widespread proliferation of digital media. And according to some studies, the period post Y2K, that is the millennium is actually considered as the beginning of a digital age. So in the recent times, Digital media is also known as new media or multimedia. We need to understand what sets digital media apart from other traditional media, such as a print or a radio or a television, is its power of interactivity. So the turn of new millennium witnessed the advent of Web 2.0 technology that enables network communication not just to become larger, but it also offers an interactive platform for common people like you, me, to access as well as create content in a collaborative manner. So the Web 2.0 technology has actually given birth to what is popularly known as the social media. The key characteristics of digital media is deeply rooted in the postmodern philosophy of self-consciousness. Digital media is a self-centered technology and individual with access is a content creator. The interactivity that is enabled by Web 2.0 has also ushered in a new kind of culture, which is known as the participatory culture. And media scholar Henry Jenkins has largely worked in this area. And this is what he says. The media landscape is undergoing a huge transformation wherein amateur people are gaining access to technology and are becoming empowered to create content that reaches the global audience at the click of a button. Jenkins anticipated this in 2006, and we are seeing the daily manifestation of it in 2020. 
Let us understand what has happened to our communication landscape. Our communication scenario, which was more or less interactive, one-on-one, -on -one, has become multimodal. And what do I mean when I say multimodal? It means the internet technology has integrated aspects of print, aspects of radio, television, and together, we are not just reaching to one person, but we are reaching to multitude of people at the same time. So there's no clear distinction between a producer and a consumer. One is a producer as well as a consumer at any given point of time. And digital media technology has transformed this linear sender, message, channel, receiver communication process into a multi-level traffic. And we are living in a information pandemic, like I told you earlier, at one point of time, we can be connected to hundreds of apps and thousands of people across the globe. Like you can take this webinar as an example. Okay, now let us get some basic understanding of what do I mean by digital media literacy. In a very layman understanding, literacy means basically the ability to read and write. So if we apply this core tenet to digital media, firstly, it means the ability to understand, analyze the digital media content. And secondly, use this medium to create content and communicate effectively. So at a time when we have got back, you know, to scribbling in the walls and living our lives literally in these walls, digital media literacy basically means the ability to access, understand, evaluate, analyze, and then create content. As much as it's about the technology that connects us to the world over, it's also about the person behind this technology. It's about you, I. I consider it, it's more important. So as we negotiate our way through a fake news and misinformation and disinformation, and then the staggering statistics of death and multitudes of images of pain and suffering that has started to numb us, I feel in such a scenario, digital media literacy is a life skill. So as per this understanding, it has two core aspects. One is the consumption of the digital content. Other is the production of the digital content. And this talk today focuses on the first aspect, and that includes skills to critically analyze and reflect on digital media content. I strongly feel that you know, one needs to have a certain sort of skills or maybe a spectacle so that you can see clearly and understand. And my aim today is to uh, leverage your position, or maybe I would say add a little wings, give you wings like eagles, so that you can see the larger picture, the as we say it, you can see the bigger picture. So that's what my agenda is today. So to begin uh, this process, we need to locate ourselves and we need to map our position. We are called technically the digital immigrants. I don't know about you, but I'm raising both my hands because I am a digital immigrant. And this concept of digital immigration was firstly used by Mark Prensky in 2001. And what he means is it tells the people who were born before the widespread use of digital technology. So to be precise, if we go by the age, the date, it is here, it's 1985. And why I say I'm a digital immigrant, I'm telling you it has been a struggle for me and it has been a wild chase. I'm running after technology. By the time I think I'm convinced I've learned one technology, there's another one coming up. So it's been like that for me. So the students that we are actually dealing in are youth which who are between 15 to 24 uh, age group, and they are basically digital natives. So understanding this position is very, very important. Okay, let's just look into uh, technology and how it has manifested into our lives. Uh, technology, we all understand, has been an integral aspect of human civilization. Whether we like it or dislike it, our life is pretty much oriented around it. And uh, what's also interesting is there is a certain kind of euphoria about the technology, whether it is the invention of the wheel, the steam engine, or the information technology, or artificial intelligence, each of this technology has revolutionized, it has transformed our life. And I personally feel that it won't be fair to simply say that, you know, it has made our life easier. 
I think that would be a very layman way of understanding the technology's impact. The new emerging information technology has such an effects in our life, conditioning the way we think and act. This whole fascination about the technology is uh, so ingrained in us that you know, we oftentimes use the word synonymously for the concept of development, growth, progress. So the positive side of technology is so overpowering and overwhelming. It's almost like a lover gazing at its beloved and those initial few months where everything seems beautiful, promising about the other person. There's no problem, no issues. The positives of the technology has overtaken its downside, which appears slowly. And when it appears, we don't know how to deal with it, you know, much like the coronavirus. So what do we do? We again go back knocking into another technology to deal with it. So an eminent uh, uh, anthropologist, Heather Horst, credits information technology to transform our homes and society, which largely centered around kitchen and living room to now, Twitter, Facebook, Facebook, WhatsApp chats, and it's a fact that we're more active on WhatsApp family groups than in real life. So if we just look into our tribal societies thriving on its oral traditions, whose values and knowledge circulated around the hearth amidst the burning fire and talks and laughter and songs and other folk forms are now way too busy tapping their fingers on the screen. The fire you know, that united has been replaced with digital media technology. And the internet enabled smartphone does not have access just to our bedrooms, but I'm sure you'll agree with me. It is also a witness to our most intimate moments of our life. The idea of sharing these insights is not to get into a Leodite versus technophile kind of a debate. Um, just for the, somebody who is hearing this word for the first time, the term Leodite comes from a group of people who opposed the Industrial Revolution. So in the 19th century, the followers of this person called Ned Ludd smashed machinery and in factories across the Britain, Britain, fearing that these new devices would destroy their jobs and livelihood. Whereas on the contrary, you have the term technophile, which is coined by Neil Postman in 1985. And these are the group of people who are pro for technology. So this talk today is not about deciding who wins, whether it's the Leodite or Neo-Leodite or the technophiles. But I certainly want you to live the web webinar with a single agenda. And that is like each one of you should think more critically about the technology. And in this scenario, is the digital media technology. Okay, now let's look into some of the basic statistics. And as you see these numbers on the screen, I also want you to reflect a little bit on your own digital consumption habits. Um, this is what the statistics reveal. And mind you, these numbers are before the pandemic and lockdown started. 60% of the world's population is already online. And the latest trend suggests that more than half of the world's total population will use social media by the middle of this year, which is now. Uh, an average Indian spends about six and a half hours on the internet. There's a huge spike in digital media use since the corona outbreak. And with work from home situation, the digital media use has just increased by many fold. And I'm sure you'll agree with me on this. The current pandemic has pushed us more towards the technology. My personal experience has been quite a daunting one. You know, April was my month to go on a digital detox because for the past one year, I've literally lived an intense virtual life, collecting data and um, writing my thesis. And I was so looking forward to April, but with this lockdown, it's not at all possible. I have, um, I'm completely dependent on my phone and particularly on the internet to get an update on my parents who live up far away from me. And um, I am dependent on the WhatsApp group uh, where my son's schoolwork comes. I'm conducting classes like many of you uh, through different platforms and assessing their work. And I have webinars to attend and as well as to conduct. So before the pandemic, um, my screen time was about four to five hours a day. And uh, what about you? How much is your screen time? So now after the pandemic, can you guess what is my screen time? 
it's about seven to eight hours. And this is not just my figure. So we, you can imagine, we are surrounded by technology more than anything or anyone. And we all know that our personalities are shaped by our social circle. We are sum total of our social behavior. And what's our social behavior is decided by what media content are we regularly consuming. Sometimes consciously, oftentimes subconsciously. And there's an interesting research in this regard, which is known as the mirror neuron research. You know what this research says? A very simple theory is mirror neuron is actually the reason why happy people make others smile and tense and anxious people make us nervous. They are the reason why yawning is contagious. So this research was carried out by a team of scientists and the study was primarily done on Matak monkey. The findings of which are later found to be correlated to human behavior. The scientists discovered that there was a specific class of visuomotor neurons in the brain that enabled us to understand uh, through direct observation. So if I have to tell you in a nutshell what this study is about, it is, it says that humans are hardwired to imitate. From the time, you know, we are born, we make sense of the world by what we see around us. And this in turn shape our actions and understanding. So scientists working in this field, they say that our survival depends on understanding the actions, intentions and emotions of others. And mirror neurons allows us to grasp the minds of others not through conceptual reasoning, but through direct simulation. This is exactly the theory that says violence breeds violence, and hence children are kept away from the destructive games. Okay, so let us now travel a little in history. One of the most remarkable time of human history were the uh, colonial times. What comes to your mind when we talk about colonialism? A difficult, a subjugated life, right? Discrimination, power, control, authority, and domination of the poor, cheap labor, exploitation of natural resources, right? And maybe much more. Now, the purpose of colonization was to serve as a resource of inexpensive labor and natural resources. The outcome of these colonies were never intended for development. Though, you know, there is a uh, alternate paradigm where some colonists also felt that they were helping the indigenous population by bringing them religion and civilization. However, I believe the reality is often subjugation, displacement, or death. So if given a chance, I doubt if any of us would want to be the subjects of these colonies. And we have enough books, literature, movies, to thank the life we live today, you know, but however you may think, you know, we have surpassed that period and we're living in a postmodern democratic sphere, but not that way. Two senior media academicians and author, authors who have extensively worked in the area of uh, media anthropology and data societies, they are Nick Coldry and Ulysses Medias, they shatter this vision of ours. And they critique the larger role of digital technology into our daily lives and say that we are rather living in data colonies. Now, what is this data colonies? In their last latest book, The Cost of Connection, it was released in 2019, they highlight in great depth as how we may be confined to a geographical place, but also how we are constantly guided by the virtual boundaries of Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, WhatsApp, and hundreds of other apps. Now imagine a very, very simple scenario I'm giving you where we have an app that alerts us to drink water. Something that's so basic that our body should signal and our mind should be alerting us is switched over to technology. So now drinking water is a goal. And when we achieve the target, the app celebrates our feet and encourages us to share our scores. And that's not enough. The app also rewards us. And if we can get more friends also into the same habit. So now 
you tell me if app is doing this very basic core function of our life then what are we doing what is our mind engaged in so now there is an app that knows uh, your heart rate there is another app that captures our everyday movements and there is another app that knows our buying behavior etc etc and etc so what are we turning into if not robots i mean isn't this what george orwell depicts in his most popular novel 1984 somebody somewhere at the top has access to all our life patterns and watches us from the time we are uh, awake till the time we sleep has all the idea about our life so we are living in data colonies and that's what these academicians say so historical colonialism you have to understand this is about annexing territories our resources and bodies that worked on them data colonies do not work that way data colonies grab power uh, in a much simpler way all you need is an app which we given access to every bit of our life patterns and needs willingly and also we are most willing to be the cheap digital labor force constantly powering the digital platforms in the guise of empowerment and entertainment so colonizing a country is no more about military invasion but in recent times it can be databases with a single click so during the colonial times let's keep in mind that the british or the dutch or the french or the portuguese entered the country and they gradually extended their dominance to expand business it is a slow process of control and we need to acknowledge that so having said all of this so what what's the way out i mean should we abandon the technology throw away our mobile phones i wish that was possible you know but maybe it won't be feasible or even remotely possible at least it won't be possible for me though i have many friends who have successfully gone into digital detox some of them have also been successful to stay away from most of the networking apps but i think the way out won't be to swim um across the tide but i think the way out is understanding the larger game plan and we can certainly change the way we use the technology now if you ask me what is that way i am sorry i cannot prescribe you you have to figure it out your own way but we all can definitely spell s c e p t i c i s m skepticism and like i told you in the beginning that some critical framework is needed so here's my critical framework always ask yourself the why question you know a lot of stu our students when they join media they have such romantic ideals they have these fantasies but within a month we take all of that out so we place them behind the camera and we help them to dissect each and everything so after that movie viewing experience is no more pleasurable it's punctuated with a lot of analysis so you have to get into that mold annoying mold you may say it so you have to constantly ask the why question um one thing interesting is we have this free data plans so remember when geo launched the free free data thing so what has happened is amidst the pandemic different telecom companies have come up with various uh, lucrative work from home offers now how is it that you know our skeptic mind races to find out why a stranger or our neighbor is been extra kind to us to give us freebies like why is it that you know we have accepted free internet as a norm let us all remember that we are in a neo liberal economy it's a profit driven economy and nothing comes for free so what is taken from us in exchange of this 24 hours uninterrupted data supply maybe our peace of minutes. mind um maybe our peace of mind uh maybe we are fooled into the story of interconnectivity and uh, being up to date we say digital media is egalitarian and democratic and mobile phone is the most empowering technology my question however is 
if you have placed the phone in our hand, what have you taken from us in exchange? Isn't that the time that was engaged in traditional societies into folk forms and community connectivity is today mindlessly scrolling? Is it like really empowerment and power? Or is it about turning everyone into the same ship so that it's easy to control? Um, do you remember the practice of making the naughtiest uh, and the unruly kid as the monitor of the class? You know, I was one of them. So when we are actively engaged, weaving the odds of the world through our mobile screens, as we navigate through trends and hashtags in our mind, you know, is our mind conditioned and taken away from other things that are equally important and relevant? What's beneath the COVID numbers? Are we trapped too much into the holy cow mirage or the TikTok versus YouTube fight? How is it that, you know, some events and activities trend in media? We have a theory called agenda set setting and gatekeeping. So, which simply states that no media content is an accident, but work of a well thought out scheme of a group of people who control the finances and the creative content, who carefully decide what I should see and how much and when. So have you ever tried to you know, understand the social media algorithm gimmicks? Such algorithms works on the dominance of numbers. So majority, you know? So then how is it that the minority or the peripheral groups, especially the tribes in Northeast, will ever trend and catch the imagination of these social media platforms? And this is where, you know, I think my thought coincides with our Prime Minister, Prime Minister Modi, when he says we have to be vocal for local. So what is around us that needs our immediate attention? I feel that this digital media and social media is like an opium. You know? So it is up to us how much we wish to con consume, at what rate, at what level. Intention is not to take away the due credit from digital technology. Yes, we do have a number of positive developments. There are resistant movements that are fueled by social media and digital media technologies, but we also cannot ignore the big bully. I mean to say the big brother to whom we have willingly given access to our data and who's consistently watching us. A lot of us shun away from digital media. Many of us consider it as a filthy ground. We take it very lightly saying that, ah, oh, it's a place where people who are jobless find some purpose. But my own research tells me social media places are rather vibrant laboratories, you know, where people try, test, experiment, not just their identities, but also social relationships. And the perfection of this happens on the on-ground life. So Corona has severely pushed us towards digital technology and we don't have a choice. And remember our kids, are also using the technology. So they don't just have access to our data now, they have an access to our kids' data, their life pattern, what they're doing. So we, we actually do not have a choice. So when we don't have a choice, I feel we might as well understand the gimmicks and play our part. Thank you very much. I hope you gained uh, some insights from this talk. Thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, we have received a lot of positive feedbacks for uh, Professor Timothy Suba's uh, session. They've also mentioned that they've learned something new from the communicative uh, English teaching session. We've also had a lot of feedback from uh, for uh, your session, ma'am, Rajini. And people are talking a lot about online literacy and the need for online uh, classes and so on. So there's a lot of debate going on in the chat box regarding how much of the digital literacy we should have. And that's very interesting to see. Now, to continue in the, that line of thought, we will now invite Professor Rosemary Usharari, and uh, we will invite her to come online now. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Jacob. Um, a very good morning. Yeah. Yes. So, a very good morning to you all. So, uh, can I uh, start, Jacob? Okay, so just a second. So I will be talking today about um, understanding ethics, social responsibility and the media. And I thought that what might be the best way to do this is by first showing you a video. Um, 
So I'm going to do that before I continue. Uh, just a second. I'm just trying to unmute the video just a second. So well, anyway, so um, while as, as this takes time to open, and let, let me just um, start off by telling you that since we are talking about um, ethics today, um, we know that uh, it, it's media basically is a whole a lot of different mediums that are available to us. Uh, but I'm going to start off by specifically uh, discussing about journalism and start off by talking about media ethics related to journalism. And I think the video should play now. I'm so sorry about this technical snag. Uh, can you hear the sound of the video? Uh, Ma'am, if uh, yes. what you can do is if you can just uh, stop the share and start it again yeah. and uh, okay. open the video player first. Are you selecting the video uh, software, ma'am? Yes, I have selected the video software. Right now, we cannot see it. Just a second, I'm really sorry yeah. about this. Uh, if you have the link, you can go online to YouTube and click on the link and the video will come online. I think that would be another option. Uh, yeah, just a second. Um, share. All right, in the meantime, I would like to okay, remind- I think, yes. Yeah, you ready? Yeah, okay, you can please send your your um, your questions again to video yeah, at nc.easy.in. Okay, over back, over to Ma'am Rose Mary again. news landscape is unique. The country has almost 52 official languages. Mm -hmm. Over the past decade, Indians have witnessed the rise of a new breed of news anchor, brash, aggressive, unapologetically nationalistic. They trade in conflict, fear, and spectacle. It's a formula that tends to pay off in the ratings and online. A you should be arrested. People like you should be arrested. You understand that? Let's play the interview of Deepti with Tejasvi. How was the meeting? This is not a right place to talk, actually. Go back. Get out of my country. I don't know where. We don't have democracy. Don't open your mouth. Why? Quiet. Who are you? Because you've spoken too much. Who are you? Sir Ali Muddin Khan, are you an Indian or are you a Pakistani? Yes, Sharfuddin, you have to behave. Behave properly, Ilyas Sharfuddin. It's a warning. Varna, I know how to do a window and how to do a window. We will take the advice of the debate of democracy. So I will out you. I will ask you to get out. 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 I don't want to. You are a very senior person.
person. I don't want to interrupt you, but you force me. I will. So it. Well, so that is um, basically. I think what you saw, what you witnessed just now, uh, was not some sort of a, 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 you know, it was not some sort of a performance that was actually going on. Uh, it was something which you actually must be seeing on a daily, um, on a daily basis all the time. Uh, so I'm going to start off by talking about uh, media ethics, and. Um, Sorry, hello. Sorry, my internet is giving me a little bit of a problem. Yeah, ma'am, can you just put on your video also? We can hear you clearly. Yeah. I'm really sorry, my internet is giving a bit of a problem right now. I'm just going to join in once again. If that, is that all right? I'm really sorry about this. Uh, this is fine now. It's it's working fine. Yeah, no, but I'm not being uh, the, the 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 on my laptop. It is actually not really okay. Working, so I'm just going to log in once again. I'm really sorry about this. Another option, Ma'am Rosemary, is to uh, turn off your video and keep with the uh, keep going on with the audio. Right. Once again, I will take this time to remind you that you can uh, send in your questions. Please mention the name of the speaker you would like to direct your questions to. Uh, send it to vedu at anthonys.ac.in, V-E-D-U at anthonys.ac.in. That's A-N-T-H-O-N-Y-S dot A-C dot in. If you, have, um, if you would like to get a certificate, uh, you can fill in the feedback form towards the end of the webinar. We will be putting up the link on the chat box. So, so please wait until that time. Uh, do not fill the form right now because the system will reject it. Okay, so we will wait until the uh, towards the end of uh, the webinar. Uh, we will send you the, the link to the feedback forms and you can fill it then. We will also have an important uh, presentation from uh, the principal of St. Anthony's College who will be talking a little bit on what is faculty development, what is faculty enrichment, after the fourth speaker. So we, we request you to please stand by uh, for that important presentation also towards the end. Uh, we, it looks like Ma'am Rosemary is back online. Uh, we will go back to you, Ma'am. Please come back. We need to hear you talk about ethics and media and how important that is. So over, over, over to you once again. Uh, sorry, ma'am. You just unmute. Uh, we can't hear you right now. Just unmute on the phone. Okay. Um, is that yeah? Now all we right? can hear you. Yeah. Okay. okay. That's good, ma'am. Yes. I'm really, I really apologize about that. You know, technology has made life easier, but at the same time, in situations of this kind, it has also probably uh, made it more difficult for us. So anyway, yeah. I'm going to um, uh, start off by talking about um, what journalism used to mean once upon a time. I think you saw what, it, what the video that I showed you at the moment was a video that, uh, that had snippets about what happens in journalism on a daily basis in our country today. It was not some performance that was staged. And I guess I think it's not something alien to us. We are all used to seeing that. Um, the thing with journalism was that once upon a time, it was these were the main things that people actually had to uh, think about. Um, when they were delivering stories to us, they had to seek an external discoverable truth. Uh, if no clear single truth was available, their duty was to actually present uh, two opposing sides of the story. That means they had to present all sides of the story that was av available at that point of time. The sources with, from which information was gathered um, is basically, it was, is supposed to be from recognized expertise and recognized authority. The material presented has to be very, very objective. And consumption wise, the audience that we are basically looking at uh, were a general mass audience. You know, for example, I think you remember the days of the Rudarshan when we had just one particular channel where we could, uh, when we heard all the programs that catered to almost every person and every set person's sensibilities, whether it was Krichi Darshan or a Sitar recital or the news. So basically, there was a general mass audience to whom tra uh, traditional journalism was catering, uh, catering towards. Then it was also a one-way communication, but things started change, uh, changing with time. Uh, what were these changes that started taking place? 
there were new forces that came into the picture to oppose this idea of journalism. The new forces that we are talking about is affordable satellite technology. This means to say that you have instant tra transmission of messages and anyone, anywhere can actually uh, very easily make use of this, uh, this uh, affordable technology and instantly transmit whatever messages that they wish to transmit. Second important thing is the web and the instant access that it provides us. Instantly, we can get hold of the information that we are seeking for. Instantly, uh, we can actually use it as a podium uh, you know, as a microphone to put forward our uh, points of view. Uh, I think you all remember when we studied history, we talked about how, uh, in fact, whenever we talk about history of communication, we talk about how it all started with uh, the town square, where you would have these town criers and they would come and they would um, announce uh, the different messages that the king has or the different goods that were in sale, they would shout it out in the town square. Today, the web is our town square. It provides us an instant access to information. And as soon as we get that information, we can instantly uh, use the web again as a podium to deliver that information. This means to say that with cable, satellite, dish, web, all of these technologies at our hand, it has made us as consumers also extremely expectant of having information come to us 24 hours. So it's no longer restricted with space and time as it used to be once upon a time. Another thing is the blurring lines. I think you have already observed the clips that I showed you just now about uh, the news channels and the various antics that take place in news channels. The interesting thing is once upon a time when we studied various media, and especially at that point of time, we used to refer, literally refer to them as traditional media, uh, we could distinctly distinguish what was news, what was entertainment, what was advertising, what was an opinion. But to those today, these lines are blurry. Look at the news clippings that I just showed you. Is that just news? It is entertainment at the same time. It is also opinion. Very often these panels actually make use of it to advertise their points of view as well, to propagate something. It's a propaganda. So basically the lines between all of this content that is delivered to us is really, really changing. So what is happening is that we are getting a mixed bag of messages. These are defying what traditional journalism is all about. And today, new journalism looks like this. It's all about noticing issues and events. We report today, but today we don't just resort to looking at um, uh, direct sources that have actually been, um, you know, uh, also look at open sources. Sources, we look at what everybody's opinions are. We look at different points of view because all of that kind of adds on to our perspective of things and that ends up being reported. Also, what is important actually, of course, as journal uh, journalists is that all of this information that is available to us, ultimately we should find a way of actually filtering it through our journalistic perspective. And the interesting thing is, unlike what used to happen once upon a time, like during the days of the Darshan, now we have targeted audiences. It's interesting because it's not just we that we have targeted audiences for different kinds of news, uh, for different kinds of media. We have target audience, targeted audiences for news media itself. There are so many news channels out there that we pick and choose and decide which ones are the ones which we think are authentic and which ones are the ones that we don't think are authentic enough. So the, the ones that we pick, we are the targeted audiences of those. So which means to say new journalism today looks at the fact that consumption basically depends on targeted audiences, uh, no longer just for a whole mass. You literally demassify them. Then we talk about the importance of feedback. Uh, the interesting thing is once upon a time, we got information, we had no ways of putting the feedback. Just a few minutes back when I was suffering that technical snag, we already heard about Sir Jacob talking about the feedback that he's already received about the sessions that have gone on. This is exactly what happens with news today. Before the news goes up and immediately the feedback, people are already discussing about it. In fact, there's a very important saying that today, breaking news might not come to you from the journalist you see on stream. It might actually come to you from the next your next door neighbor who knows it first before you will that journalist. That's how fast uh, information is traveling. That's how fast discussion of information is actually traveling. That brings us to a very, very important um, issue. Studies, because of this sort of new journalism, this new breed of journalism, this new sort of journalism that has really come into existence, um, studies of different scholars and academicians, they have started discussing about this, this important aspect about journalism now, and they're asking, because audience members can control, because they can control what news is collected, they can control what news is disseminated, that means what news is given out there, they can do this job individually on their own, they can do it collectively as a group. So. Have we reached a point of time when we should allow consumer judgment to substitute news judgment? That's, you know, these questions are beginning to come up. 
But is that possible? When we look at journalism and journalism's ethics, we look at journalism's social responsibility more than anything. The truth, as very beautifully stated by Giles, is that just because you have bought the mastery of new technology, it does not mean to say that it is a substitute for journalistic skills and values. You may be an expert in making use of technology, an expert in getting hold of information, but that does not necessarily mean that you use the values and the social ethics that you need to use, the social responsibility that you need to use in order to deliver information and put it out there. Another important point is another important question basically that people are asking. Disintermediated news is no longer selected by editors, which is true. We know that when we say disintermediated, it's something like disintegrated. We get uh, not only is news very vast and just, you know, completely everywhere, small in bits and pieces and chunks, but the different media that it comes to us from is, you know, there's multiple sources that it comes to us from because it's, it's no longer a set group of uh, editors sitting and deciding this is the news that goes out today or this is the news that doesn't go out today because in fact they are running after news before it reaches anyone else because they're too scared that somebody else is going to get it before them. So the important question is, should journalists then just ask people what do they want and just give it to them? Because that's what journalism seems to be like uh, very often today. But again, the important thing to remember is that when we talk about values, ethics, and social re responsibility, therefore, what is in the public interest and what the public is interested in are very different concepts. I repeat, what is in the public interest and what the public is interested in are very different concepts. And we have to understand that. So what is journalism's responsibility? Journalism's responsibility, therefore, is to work in the public interest of people not in providing to the public what is what they are interested in. But is that possible in, our, in this media landscape that we live in today? Is it actually happening? Ideally, it should. But I will give you a very um, you know, sad um, example of this, in fact. Just recently on Sunday, I think we were all shocked by um, the death of a rising star of Bollywood. And the job of news channels in public interest was to just provide us the information of his death. But they went a step further. They knew that they had to run around getting hold of audiences attention to listen to their coverage of it. And so this is what they did. So some of you may not understand the language at all in Hindi, uh, but I will just read out to you certain important headlines that they had. One of the headlines mentioned, Patna ka Sushant Mumbai may fail few. Why did Patna Sushant fail in Mumbai? Another one said, Saso ki dor kai poche ho gayi. Kai poche happened to be one of Sushant uh, Singh Rajput's first movies. And kai poche is a fighting terminology. That means, uh, you know, in, in terms of flying kites, when people, they, they, it literally means I cut it off. So which means they literally played on those words to give us his news. Another one, another headline said, Aise kaise hit wicket ho gaye Sushant. Again, referring to the fact that he had played the role of Mahindra Singh Dhoni in uh, his biopic. And so they tried to make use of cricketing terminology to express that. Another one said, played on the, uh, you know, the, the rhyming of his word, uh, the, of his name, Sushant, and said, Ashant hokar chale gaye Sushant. That means he was unpeaceful and that's how he left. Is that allowed? I mean, is that what public interest is about? That is not what journalism is about. That is, that is literally sensationalism. That is literally, that does not, that lacks the values and the ethics that is important in trying to present news. In fact, one of the channels, I think it was art that, that it pursued the father and his sisters resent, relentlessly on that same day, trying to get information about how do they feel on hearing the news? How heart-wrenchingly sad can that sort of journalism actually be? But this is not something surprising because a few years back when another very important famous celebrity had also uh, you know, um, uh, passed away, the headline was Moth Ka Bata. It was not some sort of a you know, movie a title. It was actually a headline. Um, that's how, that really makes us question what where journalism is today. And then again, let's talk about the recent coverage of COVID-19. We're not going to talk about any other, um, other aspects of it. Uh, we're just going to talk about the basic thing, how it all started as coverage. Um, Something which I would like to start before talking about this coverage is that uh, while doing a research on war journalism, on reporting conflict and on trying to figure out that, you know, there are uh, two kinds of reporting. One is war journalism. There's another that's called peace journalism. And we talk about conflict and we won't get into that now because that's another 
um, very, very vast uh, subject. But there's something very interesting that this person talked about. Every person killed in this war was first killed in the newsrooms. Coronavirus too today is war to us. We're literally at war. And before people actually die, they've all been killed one by one in the newsrooms first. How is that? Because just look at this. I'm not even referring to uh, India. This is not just in India. I think in India, we already saw the headlines. Uh, the one in the left hand, the left side of the screen that is in English, um, it basically talks, it, it basically has uh, headlines that appeared in newspapers in Australia. Uh, headlines like China kids stay home, China virus pandemonium playing on the word panda because pandas are found in China. Uh, then another one that says China is the real sick man of Asia. And these kind of stigmatize the Chinese diaspora around the world, headlines of this kind. Another one is, if you can see, uh, is, it's a French newspaper and the headline there said, Alerta Jaune, which meant yellow alert. That is the stereotypical way of addressing uh, people of the Chinese and the you know, diaspora. And it also had, um, you know, so, and it apparently had an Asian looking woman with her mouth covered. That was how coverage of uh, the virus was actually done. And that created a lot of problems. It created lots of problems, not just for the Chinese people, it created problems for those who were from the Asian region. And, and here back home in our own country, I think it was the Northeastern people who were stigmatized really badly as well because of the same, very same problem. That's what news can actually do. We should understand that. In India, it was the other way around. You know how it, is, it normally is. There was a lot of stigmatization because of the episode that took place of Tablighi in the Tablighi Jamaat. There was a lot of stigmatization that happened of the Muslim people. Now, what has that done to us? Was it in public interest? Not at all, because it's created such a stigma about the disease of coronavirus in our country that forget about stereotyping people and the origins that they come from and insulting them, which is because I think, uh, you know, making all sorts of, you know, racist comments against them. Forget about that. Look at people's um, the way people react to people who are actually suffering from the virus, the stigma that surrounds the virus. It is heartbreaking that when you watch the news of other countries like um, you know, Brazil and all of that, you hear about relatives feeling so sad and so heartbroken that they didn't get to pay their final respect and their final goodbyes to the family. But thanks to the stigmatization that was created about the disease in our country, you hear, hear news in our country about the fact that uh, somebody passed away and no relative came to claim his or her body concerned because of all that stigma that was surrounding them and they didn't want to partake of it. How sad can that be? So is that responsible journalism therefore? Thus, as a very important saying that I have here put up on the screen is, the media plays a significant part in whipping up nationalist feelings of xenophobia, racism, or ethnic ch chauvinism, even when conflict is not imminent, by reinforcing existing differences and thus accelerating and you know, a disintegrating effect. Has it always been this way? It hasn't always been this way. This was not news um, in the past. Uh, Jack Anderson was an American investigative journalist and a Pulitzer Prize winner. And according to him, he believed that journalism must comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. For that matter, in trying to do research for this presentation, articles and there are a few lines from there that I'm going to pick up and put here to show point of time. So therefore I've referred to as, a, as notes from the past. And these are some things that he has mentioned. He has mentioned that ours was not a profession for the weak hearted. It was a calling and an unabashed crusade against injustice and all forms of authoritarianism, especially government secrecy. Some of us went to jail for not revealing our sources, faced torturous defamation depositions, were constantly followed and spied on. We exposed crooked defense deals and illegal operations by the FBI and CIA. He goes on to say, we, to we told stories like it is, no holes barred. It was the people's story, so we did our job, we told it. We were simply recording what we saw. The truth poured out, not because of any compelling zeal, but it because it was a natural thing to do so. That means that was what journalism was supposed to be and journalism was. Now, talk that happens in the press club, and this is his words, is no longer about breaking stories. It's about which editor or which owner, uh, media owners in which political politician's pocket. A recent survey, in fact, talked about the fact that we have about one lakh newspapers and periodicals and some 900 TV channels. But surprisingly enough, the major producers of news content in the entire country are only 12 major, 12. Why? Because of cross-media ownership. That means most of our media organizations are owned, centrally owned by a certain group of people. Plus, another important um, point that he mentioned was 
greed, fear of political repression, polarized and intolerant society, society orchestrated uh, attacks on reporters. We know the case of Gauri Lankeshwar in Bangalore, what happened to her. Cowardice, erosion of a moral core have taken a toll on the Indian media in this decade. More than ever before, mainstream media must uh, you know, they have to make sure that they have to take on trolls and Twitter execution squads. They have to make journalism relevant and credible again. Um, that said, what are the problem areas there for? You can't completely blame the journalists and Five media organizations, even. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. You can't really completely blame them as well, because there are certain problems that take place. And I shall quickly go through them. There is media ownership problems. Media ownership means to say that it's the owners who decide what content goes out, where it is distributed what uh, resources are allocated to what kinds of jobs, how hiring and firing takes place, what work autonomy is allowed for journalism and the stories that they carry out. Uh, besides that, concentration of media on ownership, it means to say that since we have, um, you know, there's a monopoly, there's one set of people who kind of monopolize most of media, there's standardized content that comes to us, which means to say that we get content which is going to be, uh, which is the same across all of the different platforms that they actually are owners of. Problem is that very often these media owners are globalized. So that means to say that they have a globalized monopoly. And again, they keep providing us with standardized content everywhere. Why? Because of the fact that they have to be consistent with the branding that they actually uh, stand for. Then because of this, we have a lack of localization. We don't really get uh, you know, uh, local problems coming out into the picture. We get to hear uh, more about uh, things that are going to you know, uh, appeal to the masses more than others. Um, then there are other factors, factors like the profit motive, factors like content sources, public relations activities. Then something very, very important is media funding system. So you can't really blame it. You know, uh, what happens is advertising happens to be one of the largest revenue streams of media organizations. What they end up doing is they partner with product advertisers and they start creating cross promotion campaigns. Now, um, that is why we do understand what happens, what takes place, the news that the information that we start getting hold of. Uh, they are compelled to make it as meaty, as attractive as possible so that they can have more viewers listen to them, more viewers watch their channels, and more viewers means to say there are more advertisers who will come to buy airtime, you know, and they will get more revenue and they will be able to actually um, um, conduct business. Then there's owner concentration of advertising agencies as well. So there is, it's not just monopoly uh, in media organizations, even in advertising agencies, they are global in nature. Um, and most of the content, therefore, that is delivered to us through the media is advertising induced because they don't have a, a, you know, an option but to try to actually solve these problems. Possible solutions, of course, are uh, some of these possible solutions, which if we implement probably uh, can um, save the situation and can bring about some sort of ethics and social uh, responsibility out there. Number one is implementation of policies about media structure to counter destructive growth and character of media owners. Having government legislation, which means to say that they should maintain a democratic process when deciding on media policies, especially when it comes to ownership policies. Media ownership should not be a clear cut right versus left issue. It's like uh, interesting how these days um, media actually openly blatantly talk about the fact that they are right wing media or they are left wing media, but that's not what media ownership should actually be about. Then it should be the citizen groups. That means we citizens can form anyone. It's not just media people and media people who work in the media. It's citizens who can help focus policymakers on the ethical and democratic obligations. You know, we already know the power of people coming together and trying to do something like this. It can be uh, possible. Plus, media owners can maintain an ethical stance. They have to distinguish between what is maximum profit and what is reasonable profit. Media specific policies should have democratic incentive and disincentives, which means to say they do something not according to the policies they get, you know, they do not get the incentives that they are promised. This means to say that we will have start having, instead of having a monopoly of certain people only on the media industry, we will be able to create a diversity of ownership. Plus large media corporations uh, determining uh, journalistic, aesthetic and ideological standards. Um, but important that creative autonomy is given to journalists. If they do not have creative autonomy and if they are told to do what their owners ask them to do, it will not be possible to have fair uh, journalism anymore. Media scholars and teachers should actively raise the issue of media ownership. And the most important is, of course, government policymakers. They should not just go and make policies themselves. They should include communication scholars as resources for decision making. But the most important of all of these is the media users, the citizens, everybody, you and I, irrespective of how much we know about it. 
Where, how do we look at media when we get journalistic stories out there? Apply our own personal ethics to be able to judge and figure out are they right or are they not right? Second important thing is keep informed, understand how media ownership is taking place and understand that the media content that is coming to us from certain media organizations is because of the media ownership, uh, the media, the, the, the people who actually own uh, those media channels. Supporting alternative forms, we know already, I've already specified about it because we are so dependent on advertising revenue that sometimes you really can't help it. Journalists are compelled to do all kinds of antics to make sure that people start watching them. Otherwise, if they don't watch them, they don't get advertisers to uh, want to pay uh, in order to advertise in their channels. Second important thing is letting government representatives know when they believe media policies should be changed or it should be reinforced. That's very, very important. Understand that we need to be the ones who try to figure out, create forums to be able to discuss and let them know that, yes, we want media policies to be changed. We want media policies to be reinforced. Um, so I don't know how much uh, that's said and done. I would like to leave with these particular lines. That is, news is what someone is trying to hide. The rest is advertising. Remember that. So um, I actually plan to finish it off with a small video, but I don't really know how much time I have left. Do I, can I do that? So, okay. So then I should put a close to this here by stating that, uh, uh, remember, these are the lines that I would like to leave you with. News is what someone is trying to hide and the rest is advertising. So uh, judge content that is delivered to you accordingly. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, ma'am. I'm sorry to cut you off. We wish we had one more time for another round of another video, but we would like to continue and go on to our next speaker. We have uh, been receiving a lot of feedbacks from our attendees and there have been very, very interesting feedbacks on that. We've talked about how uh, the news media have sometimes created the news rather than reported the news and how some news can be unreliable. Well, uh, we are going to go on to the next speaker, Reverend Father Saji St uh, Stephen is online, and we're going to request him to, uh, to uh, take his time and present his, and give his presentation. Yes, hello, Father. Okay. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you, Father. Am I, am I audible? Yes, you're audible and you're clear. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, my dear teachers, it's wonderful being with you here this afternoon. In the first place, I want to congratulate all of you. The reason is, well, you are carrying a very, very heavy responsibility and you have taken it upon yourself. Very often we say the, the tomorrow's world depends on the youth of today. Perhaps I would change it a little and say tomorrow's world depends on you and me. We as faculty, we as teachers, we can change it. Well, uh, what is my, uh, what am I going to talk about at this time? To just think about, for sharing with you, my joy of educating people to values. You may think why that is required. Is it really required? Let me just share with you a book that was, uh, uh, that was written in 2000, in uh, 2010, the name of the book is, Why do I need a teacher when I have got Google? I'm sure the question is, the book is very, very relevant for all of us. These days, all of us are busy, preparing the online classes, putting it up, teaching the students. And as Google is becoming more and more important and it is becoming more and more important, perhaps this question is very, very pertinent. Why do I need a teacher when I got Google? As a teacher, definitely, definitely we will say Google cannot replace a teacher. Why not? Google can replace us. If you look at our education from one point, that is of passing on information, making people more intelligent. From that aspect, definitely Google can take over us, take the place. As Martin Luther King Jr. said, intelligence plus character, that is a goal of true education. 
if this character aspect comes into our teaching, definitely Google cannot do it. You know, the, the, the sense of touch that perhaps that we do, the, the way we are able to change students, talk to them, having a personal relationship, molding them to someone beautiful, someone wonderful in their life, that perhaps Google cannot, Google cannot do it all. For that, we are required. And so be happy, be proud of our now, this aspect of education as intelligence plus character is perhaps what everyone talks about. We also know that. Jesus said this, be salt of the earth and light of the world. Salt of the earth. Making our life, make others' life a little more comfortable, a little more nice. Making their life a little more beautiful. The salt of the earth, please mind, it is not saltier. You know, we understand the difference. What happens when when you make others' lives salty. That is not Jism, but this is something beautiful. And uh, those are from Don Bosco institutions. This is a quote that is often said. What Don Bosco wanted, what are the institutions wanted? It is God making students into God fearing, honest citizens. God fearing, honest citizens. On the one aspect, there is intelligence that is required, but that alone is not enough. We need, we need to make them honest citizens. We need to make them people who are God fear. I have similar ideas also uh, told by Pope Francis in his document, Christus Vivit, where he says, wherever we are, we always have an opportunity to share the joy of the gospel. What is joy of the gospel? Joy of the gospel is just living a life of justice, peace, respect, love, joy, acceptance, that is the joy of the gospel. When we begin to live that life automatically, you know, there is a joy that will ultimately come into our life and we need to share that. And we can do it everywhere. We can do it in our, in our uh, classrooms, in our playground, wherever we are, we can do it. Now, all of us understand this is actually the, the goal of education. Goal of education and integral development. All of us know that. But somewhere, something goes wrong. And that has been beautifully said by C.S. Lewis, a very famous uh, writer. He says, education without values, as useful as it is, seems rather to make man a more clever devil. Huh, this is a quite a hard statement. Education without values, as useful as it is, seems rather to make man a more clever devil. Now, how many devils have we created as teachers? Have we created a lot of devils? Because if you don't give values, that's what happens. Um, now, I know there are many, many teachers from Sagrada College, Tirpatu. That is also my alma mater. I studied from 90 to 95 way. And there was one interesting um, interesting um, study that was made at the jubilee of the department of uh, social work the purpose of the study was to find out the impact of the college in that area it was a very it's a very remote area compared to other places and so the purpose of the college was to bring up the people and give them values we give them a life livelihood all the beautiful beautiful thing and there was a problem of bonded laborers and bonded children and the study revealed something startling. That was students, those who passed out from the college, now they have become the new masters of bonded laborers and bonded children. So ultimate purpose of the college totally defeated. Where did we go wrong? What happened? Today, if you look into ourselves, we know we Point a finger, point a finger at the politicians, at the bureaucrats, at uh, uh, doctors who are supposed to save their their own mind, killing people to get money. We blame a lot of people, but when we point a finger at them, you must also realize there are three fingers, three fingers pointing at me. Now, can I shirk the responsibility of creating such people in the society? Can I shirk that responsibility? We also need to take responsibility. 
Now perhaps we may say, what can we do? Yes, we can do. We cannot do with what is past, but we can do something for the future. And I'm here to tell you what can we do. We cannot change the world as it is completely, but we can light little lamps that will bring in certain amount of uh, light, certain amount of change in the world. Well, the focus of our, uh, the Department of Body Education is simply this. Become wonderful persons, not qualified monsters. Many of the students who are passed off in the college, sometimes when they call, I talk to them, chat with them, they always remind me of them. Father, we are trying our level best not to be qualified monsters. A doctor who willing to kill others for, for, for money for more money for oneself. How do we call him? Isn't he a monster? We can apply that to any field in our, in our society today. So we need to make people wonderful persons. And if I am not adding value, value, value to my teaching, then perhaps I make them more for us more qualified monsters. Now, as teachers, what makes us happy? Are the grades or the values? I know, we know grades are important. No doubt on it. Getting someone getting a first rank, beautiful, we are happy. Someone getting good marks in their exams, wonderful, we all of us are happy. And definitely we'll also be sad if people fail. But is there reality about these grades? That is the reality of values. Being in the college for so many years, what makes me happy is not how much grade what they have received. They have come because of the hard work and all that we put in, but how much a person has changed. That's what makes me more happy. You know, there was uh, once one, one student was saying, was sharing with me this, he's a Deputy Commissioner in Indian Revenue Service. And he said, Father, there are suitcases comes with the money on my table. All that I need is to just put a signature. But till today, I have been very honest. I have not taken a fine. But many of my friends have already become very, very rich. Now, that made me so happy, you know, so happy. That happiness is much more than the grades and anything else that I can think of. Here is a person going against the current. Someone wants to be honest. Someone wants to be beautiful. Isn't it wonderful? Uh, one, one of our retired teachers retired this year, Sir Robin uh, Buyan. He was sharing with us once when we were talking about how to how to create a kind of change in the student, how to help out, help them out. He was sharing this. How he and his and uh, with his wife, how they how they were able to get a girl out of drug addiction, substance abuse, and the joy with which he was sharing, though that took place a few years much much before, the joy with which he was sharing, you know, that was beyond any grade that the his students have. He remembers all this. Doesn't forget. Only really, boy, there are other students also. They as a family. So Robin with his wife, they helped out. So beautiful. Now, being in the college for many years, what makes me happy, as I said, is simply this. Those situations in which those students whose life was, I was able to change a little. I don't say 100%, but change a little. Some of them are able to come out of their alcoholic addictions. Some of them are able to come out of their tobacco addictions, pornographic addictions. And that's what gave me more happiness, more joy. And there was a there was a young boy right from the first year. Oh, he would come, run to the class. It was an easy option of sending them out, dismissing. But perseverance, being with him, talking to him, and he changed. And now he has completed not only his where the where the parents doubted that he would complete his uh, degree, he has already done his masters. He's already teaching. A wonderful teacher. You know, these are moments in which it makes us happier. People who get grades, we forget very, very often. How long will we remember that? Now, so now, when, when think about this, 
why did I come into this value education? I was teaching first, uh, the, I was in computer science, I took a master in computer science, and I was teaching computer science. What made a change in me was this, or made me to think more about educating people's values, simply this. You know, when I, when I used to take the class, I used to connect what I teach with life. At the end of the day, under the, under the, under the end of each class, I would have said at least something about life. You know, in networks it is like this, but you know, in real life, it also happens. And this way, how we can cope with that? Invariably, at the end of the class, at the end of the year, when they thank you, invariably everyone has said, well, we may forget what you taught us about networks, but the tidbits of life that you have shared with us, we will not forget. So that made me to think, that made me, why not I begin to teach completely, move into an education? Why should this wonderful chance of helping the students to, to live a better life be limited to only the Department of Computer Science? That's when it, it is thought about and then we started the Department of Value Education. Now, my teachers, at the graduation level, there is a great inner desire in the young to become a better person. Great desire. So now they are looking at life. They are experiencing the realities of life. Till then, perhaps they were students, they were teenagers, they were not understood so much. Now they are taking responsibility. And so they are thinking more about life. And it's a right time when we can really tell them, hey, this is okay, this is not okay. This is your behavior. Uh, if it will do not go wrong, you need to change. And they will accept. They will take it. And it is beautiful. And what has been my, my experiences, tangible ex experiences, okay? If you look at the college as it is now, uh, I see, at least I see, there is a lot of respect and acceptance of people. We have students coming from so many tribes. It's wonderful to see when the students going out of the college and coming into the college, I have noticed a lot of them wishing the gatekeeper good morning. Not because they are afraid. The value education has told them respect to people. And so it has, it has gone into their heart. They must respect. And how they respect the ordinary people, the sweepers, and other those who are on the campus. I always felt very happy about they, the way they would deal with it. And they began to accept tribes, different groups. I have those who are outside of this, those who are from coming from big, big states in which there's only one tribe or one group, you might find it difficult to understand. But when, when we live with so many different groups, yeah, we understand the problem. And there is, there is a change that has taken place in Laura. And we have been able to remove the, the tribal, the gender, the religious barriers that, that was there. Now, a lot of a lot of them are able to accept and appreciate the capacities of people, their talents, and we can see it very very clearly in the college, where uh, the majority of the students may be from the local those are classes, but even if there is somebody who is from another tribe, maybe only one or two or three persons, but how they would elect such a person as a representative, as a leader? Isn't beautiful? Are they able to break those barriers and accept people as people and accept their talents and their capacities? We can easily go with our own prejudices. And there is, there is something beautiful that, has, that I see that has happened. And uh, compared to the earlier days, hardly we find any people fighting. We don't need to fight because we all are friends. So why to fight? So even if I want to fight with somebody else, he is, he is a friend, he is a friend of my friend. And so how do you? No, there's a lot of things that has changed in the campus. Then uh, better social responsibilities. Students themselves are created a group called Antonio Youth Club. They want to reach out to the poor. Uh, they want to do whatever they can for them. Maybe the computer literacy, maybe taking tuitions for them, you know, reaching out to the villages whenever during their holidays and other times taking things for into the interior villages where there's a lot of, lot of poverty and a lot of things that are there, reaching out to people. They have become much more socially responsible. There was one, 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 uh, one guy who 
with his friends, put up a lot of waste bins all around the city, taking responsibility for themselves and for the society. That is something so beautiful. Better family relationships. And I tell you, I would say this is actually the best part that has happened. Students, especially those who are from far, even the students who are from their own, they are coming from their own homes, very little contact with their parents. Perhaps they would talk to them maybe once a month, or they would talk to them only when they require some money for their pocket money or whatever money they require. Otherwise, parents talking to parents was not part of their life. Because the class that we have taken on the importance of loving the parents, it has changed. A lot of them have started talking to their parents on a regular, regular. Some of them began to talk to their parents every day. Now, this is bringing the family together. Uh, what can we think better than that? Is our education reaching up to that? Information definitely will not help them in this. We need to teach them values. And to let me put it as a kind of icing on the cap. You know, there was one boy in one session. He got up and said, to the rest of the companions, all those who were there, I want to confess to you, till today, I was plotting and planning to kill my father. Today, I forgive you. You put yourselves in the place of that parent, that father. As you say, it was kind of icing on the cake. Wow. We ourselves do not believe that this was what was happening with the son. And they're willing to change a better family relationships. Well, uh, we'll, we'll look at the screen. We find a lot of young people who are techno savvy, who are very energetic. Uh, we have people who just don't care. You know, just don't care. That is the type of group that we have. Now, there's a danger. Danger is this. If I look at them as they are, and if we have some of them in our classes, you know how difficult it becomes. You know, we have some technology people who are will be doing a lot of things under the uh, under the desk when I when I lecture in the class. I'm not even able to find out. A lot of their hands are busy with the mobile. A lot of things that happens. Now, if you look at them as they are, perhaps we make them worse. But look at them as what they could become. What they could become. The moment I look, begin to look at them as what they could become, you know, my, my relationship with them changes. I begin to like this. I begin to love them. I begin to be with them. You know, and that relationship, that relationship changes them. So don't look at how they are now, what they are. They may be, look at them as what they can become. And that is going to make all the difference. Now, the thing is, what can I do? Yeah. There are many things that we can do. First of all, we need to become aware that values are not, values are learned and not gifted. Values are learned and not gifted. We begin to learn from our families and a lot more in the college, now institutions, that I teach in the classrooms. I need to teach them. So remember, values are never gifted. They are learned. They look at you, they look at me, and they learn. Become a model. Yeah, this is quite a difficult task. What do I mean by this? What do I want my students to acquire? What kind of values do I want them to acquire? If I want them to acquire a particular value, First of all, I need to become that. Just for example, we want everyone in our class to respect one another. If I want everyone to respect one another, first of all, I have to respect them. I cannot shout at them. I cannot yell at them. I cannot punish them unjustly. I cannot do those. I need to respect. They may be a little naughty at, particular, at, at times. They may be a little weird in their behavior at times, but I need to respect. You look at any, any quality that we want. Look at that. First of all, I need to become a model. Then only I can help them to invite that in their life. Have an inner curriculum of 
core values of justice, respect, peace, honesty, love, etc. Core values. We have a curriculum that uh, which we really want to complete, and we are all busy with that completing it. We just go to the classes, maybe we lecture and we come away. That is an that is an ex, uh, outside curriculum, outer curriculum that may be there, but we need to have an inner curriculum of core values. Simple example, if I if I am giving an assignment, what will I look at? Will I look at how honestly they did it? They may not have completed, but or am I interested in them just completing the completing the assignment? What will I look at? And so it is not just that we go by how much marks that people get, how much how, how well they do in the academics. We also need to look at them in this aspect. Have in a curriculum. Tell them, my idea is not okay. We need to give this more importance. Um, maybe three, four years back, I had gone to Bangalore, Christ University, when they had a, um, they had a kind of confluence for uh, those who are in administration at the higher at the higher education. There were many CEOs and others who are there. Invariably, everyone said one thing. That is. Information, teaching them, training them, they said, we will do. But in your colleges, teach them honesty. Teach them respect. Teach them uh, becoming people who are, who are full of peace. People who will do justice. They said, that we cannot teach. That you have to teach. The training part of it, we will take care. Not one. Invariably, all the CEOs who had, who had come to give us a talk, all of them said they want the same. They told us their academic performance is only a, only a door to enter. Yes, they will enter with their academic performance, important. But how long will they remain that position? It will depend on how honest they are, how respectful they are, how, how, how much they have the quality of justice. How hardworking they are. That is a way you have to teach. It all depends on those qualities will determine how long they will remain in that particular position or how long they'll work in that particular field. Very important for all of this to think about. Create an atmosphere of value, which values more than the great. Create an atmosphere where we five, value. Five minutes, brother. brother. So thank you. There you go. Where we value values more than the grades. They don't know. It's not enough to get good marks. So if I more minutes, I might get a lot of lot of more interesting examples. But we need to value, teach them to value values more than the grades. Reflection. We have something that they can do every day. At the end of the day, or in my class, I just ask, okay, maybe last two minutes. What core value do you practice today? Very you just, very honest, very you respect. No, just making them reflect a little on their own life for that day will help them. Will help them to practice these values more. Make them ethical champions. Make them do what is right. Doing what is right is important. Not doing somehow, anyhow. Doing what is right. When I say something which is not okay. I need to change, I need to tell them it's not okay. Help them to do what is right. That is, and then we give we give those kind of values and how they do, we proclaim more. We tell this is what is required. Make them ethical champions. And we will see a big change taking place. And you know, all this works only when we have a personal relationship. When you don't have personal relationships, we only lecture and come away, that will not work. But I need to create a personal relationship. There are so many. We have the we, we have the what do you call a mentoring. We need to create. And mentoring always calls for a personal relationship. Without that, we cannot have. Create a personal relationship in which things people feel very much at home. You know, formation takes place, change takes place only in the atmosphere of the family, where things can change. We need to create that atmosphere. Now, you, you, we need to become people who, are, who, who smile a lot more in our classes. People are very reasonable. 
people are very, very just. We are also we need to become. And when they realize that we are people of this sort, automatically that is that is they will imbibe that. It will create a kind of a family atmosphere in the class. And everything else will work out beautifully. I want to end with this. You are wonderful people, wonderful teachers. Let us create a legacy by touching their hearts. My Angelo, a uh, famous poet and uh, uh, and the educationist said this. I have learned people will forget what you said. People will forget what you did. But people will never forget how you made them feel. People will never forget how you made them feel. As teachers, let us take responsibility to create a new society. Is it possible? Yes, it is possible. And that, that, that change comes with a few, and that few will change the others. As long as we are, let us take a responsibility. Not just being a lecturer, but being a, being a mentor, being someone who changed their life, who touched their life with our own lives. Thank you. I hope I have inspired you. If you have not looked at this aspect, I hope I have inspired you to do something more in your, in your classes. Consider each of the students as your own brother or sister. Consider them as your own children. Perhaps that attitude will change us and they'll also be changed, taking up greater responsibility. Thank you for this. Thank you, Father, very much for that very insightful uh, session. Uh, we have looked at four different uh, topics, looked at four different areas of concern. We began with a talk on communicating English, how to teach it. And we went over to digital literacy and we talked about how much of it do we need and what is happening to us today. Then from there, we went over to ethics and media. And then we end up with the educating to values. If you look at the thread, you find there's a very interesting thread going through all of them. But I want you attendees to remember that we are doing this as part of a faculty development initiative and how all these four sessions come together under that one umbrella. So now we have a very important uh, presentation also to look at uh, from uh, Reverend Brother Dr. Albert L. Dakar, the principal of St. Anthony's College, who will help us to tie these threads together into one beautiful um, tapestry, which is the faculty development. As teachers, what is our role in, um, in our students' life? How do we uh, keep ourselves informed? What is well, how do we improve ourselves? So faculty development is a very important topic. And I would like to request and invite Brother Albert to come online and to share with us his thoughts on how we as teachers can keep on learning so that we can become effective um, communicators, effective teachers in our classroom. Uh, Brother um, Albert, over to you. Thank you, Sir Jacob. I'm very, very grateful to all the resource person, Professor Timothy Subba, Professor Rajani Chetri, Professor Rosemary, and Father Shaji Stephen. I am so much inspired. I sat throughout the session and I could see the participants over the webinar as far as the YouTube. All of us are going back educated. And I must say, well done resource person and also thank you to the uh, to the organizing team father joby joseph uh, professor jacob professor nathaniel and bablu rajak uh, my dear participants and resource person benjamin franklin amongst many other things an american polymath and one of the founding fathers of the united states had, has rightly said Without continual growth and progress, such words as improvement, achievement, and success have no meaning. These words are uh, really are easily applicable to any profession or thing in life, but they should be the very backbone of a teacher's life and calling. Any teacher who wants to sustain his or her impact in the lives of his or her student should seek to grow intellectually and emotionally. To expand his or her reservoir of knowledge, to sharpen his or her teaching skill and his or her repertoire 
of techniques, tools, and methods of teaching. A teacher who has found contentment in his or her area of expertise, style of teaching, and form of expression will soon be relegated to the museum of the have been and used to be wonderful teachers of the yesteryears. The only thing constant in life is change goes the famous adapt. Life is a series of changes that takes place every single moment and nothing is immune to this process. Teaching is something that is always in a state of flux. Even though the syllabus stays the same for a few years, many things do not. The students are never the same. The hour a teacher steps into the classroom is never the same. The chemistry between the teacher and student is never the same. Just to think of a few most pertinent situations, to be able to adapt to these changes, one must continue to learn, to become better, to discover newer ways of communicating and engaging. But to be able to do so in the best possible ways, one must be humble to acknowledge that one is not complete, does not know all and has many things to learn. One must have an attitude that is willing to learn to be taught. One must have the eagerness to look for teachers and sources of knowledge. One must be driven to step out of one's comfort zone and into the unknown. And one must be ready to unlearn sometimes that one may learn something better. To quote another great personality, John Locke, who said, the improvement of understanding is for two ends. First, our own increase of knowledge. Secondly, to enable us to deliver that knowledge to others. Faculty development and faculty enrichment program are one such platform that can provide willing teachers with the opportunity to come together to learn new things. We are delighted that at this present moment, we can bring together knowledgeable people who have been teaching for many years in the form of this webinar to share with you their experiences, knowledge and insights on how you can address some core issues in teaching, be it a subject, an area of your subject and so on. Even if the topics are a STEAM resource person will cover, do not address your specific issues and areas directly, I will still invite you to give them a hearing. And I know that you will be able to learn something worthwhile from them that will be of use to you later in future. Most of the time when we talk about equipping teachers, the discussion always turns towards the use of ICTs in the classroom. But this is just one aspect of the task of staying abreast with the changes around us. There are other aspects as well as uh, the personal qualities of the teacher that make him or her approachable, understanding and warm. The professional makeup of the teachers that make his or her lecture, preparation and delivery in the classroom effective and educative. The ability of the teacher to multitask, going from teaching to minding the class to keeping the attention of the students to evaluating and assessing their performances and so on and so forth. Anyone who thinks that teaching is easy job to do should step into a classroom for a few hours. It is not and only the brave of heart will throw themselves at the mercy of a disruptive class. And any teacher who dares to take his or her job lightly is bound to face the music, literal and metaphorical at one point or the other. This webinar is our way of taking our job as teachers seriously and of providing our counterparts elsewhere a chance to take theirs too in the same spirit and attitude. With these words, I would like to reiterate my congratulation to the resource person and to all the participants who were present in the webinar as well as in the YouTube. Thank you, God bless each one of you ever more, better ever. Thank you so much, brother principal. We, we will request you to kindly stay on for the interaction.
We are now going to have a very brief interaction with our uh, resource persons, with our speakers, and also with uh, the principal of St. Anthony's College. I would like to invite each one of you one by one to either add on to what you've said or to highlight anything that you found interesting in the presentation given by other speakers. And, uh, or if you would like to give some reaction or responses to some of the uh, comments that you might have seen on the chat box. So I will begin with uh, inviting Professor Timothy Suba, if you would like to say a few words, anything that you would like to add or you would like to react to. Thank you, Jacob. Uh, just a few things uh, that I'd like to say is that, that uh, this uh, process of learning and teaching communicative English is not something that is static. It is dynamic. We are dealing with a language, uh, English, which is a very dynamic language. The language that was spoken, let us say, <clears throat> 500 years ago by Shakespeare, by Milton, and by all the great stalwarts uh, has gone a considerable change. Uh, let us see a sea of change. And this is the dynamism of the language. And this language keeps on changing. And that is why English has been a very dynamic living language known to the world in today's world. There have been, of course, people who are Philistines to this language in many different parts of the world and even in India for that matter. In recent times, they've heard of how to do away with English uh, to stress more on vernacular <clears throat> languages. But uh, one thing is for sure that English has come home to roost, has come home to stay because it is a language that is adapting, changing to the changing times. And we have to keep ourselves updated to all these different changes, every new, phases, every new nuances that are added uh, to the coinage of the language, to the words, uh, which is very exhaustive, uh, to the various expressions uh, and uh, to the repertoire of the entire uh, range of the English language. So therefore, we have to keep on moving ahead. And just as uh, Brother Albert uh, did say in his speech about how we have to keep on learning, there is no end to learning. And I challenge and I request all our attendees, everyone who is listening, including myself, that we have to keep on learning until the time we are alive on this earth, because that is how we keep ourselves relevant. Um, I would certainly be happy to receive any kind of uh, um, feedbacks and uh, reactions, interactions, and if uh, in any way to be able to uh, communicate and clear doubts and whatever, I'll be most happy to do that. So thank you once more. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now over to uh, Professor Rajini Chetri, if you would like to add a few words or say something in response to what others have said or something that you would like to add to your presentation. Uh, thank you, Sir Jacob, uh, for this opportunity. Uh, it was pleasure listening to each one of you. There was so much to learn. Uh, simple things like what we learn from Sir Subha, we often take for granted uh, the language and he uh, stressed on such an important aspect. One thing I would like to say, I think the discourse needs to shift from online and offline to what Father Saji has said, to focus on values and intangible assets. So let's not make it a technology or pro-technology debate, but rather be very conscious and mindful of the way we use the technology so that we can inculcate the same values with regard to technology, even to our students. And that is what I want to reflect on. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Now over to um, Professor Rosemary. Anything that you'd like to add? <clears throat> Please mute yourself. Uh, unmute yourself, sorry. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, yes, yes. yes. So Go the ahead. thing is that, yeah, I, I have actually personally learned a lot as well from mm -hmm. um, all of these sessions. I just like to mention this, that probably um, I did talk a lot about sensational journalism, I guess, but there are some good journalists out there uh, as well. It's not that uh, the entire picture is very, very sad. Uh, it's just that unfortunately, probably they are few and far in between, or they don't probably have that much of, um, uh, they're not attracting us with more media content like the others are. 
so that's one thing but yes i've also it's, it's been a very very I've, I've learned a lot from all the other resource persons as well so thank you very much thank you very much ma'am over to father saji anything that you'd like to add to what you said or any reactions or responses that you'd like to give okay i see a lot of i see a lot of uh, comments on the side is wonderful somebody asked how would you teach this you know it is not it's not a rocket science that you're talking about it's very simple mm. just understanding them being with them where they feel okay you're a person who's approachable they can talk to you and they then you love them once they realize that you love them doesn't matter who or what would you do you know they'll automatically open up you automatically open up and uh, uh, you know as uh, sashi tarul said what we need today is not an informative mind but we need is a we need is a well formed mind what we need is not, not a mind that is with a lot of information but today what we require is well formed mind so far we have been talking about iq then it became eq emotional question now we are also talking about ethical question mm. and that is a big that is a big shift that we need to make and if you want to change the world as it is we need to give a lot of priority to ethical questions and to give that perhaps the other two also will take care of because once i become more and more sincere with what i do everything else perhaps will change my teaching my my learning itself will improve because i teach them do i feel them that these are important values thank you thank you so much father brother anything that you like to add any response on faculty development or anything that uh, you as a principal have seen how we can improve ourselves as teachers i would say a uh, well done my dear teachers and also the participants who were there listening to all of us i should say we as teachers we shall prevail we should be open hopeful and impatient thank you and god bless thank you so much brother we have now come to the end of our webinar we have run out of time although we would like to address all the comments and the feedbacks that we received on the chat box we do not have time but we would like to encourage you to kindly send your questions to the specific speakers at uh, vedu vedu at anthony.ac.in if you are um if you would like to get your certificate please fill in your forms your the feedback forms right now the link is up on the chat box you can do it right now and uh, and as you're doing that allow me to propose a word of thanks on behalf of st anthony's college we profoundly we are profoundly grateful to our four speakers mr suba ms chetri ms ishwari and reverend father steven we would also like to thank the principals of all the six colleges forming the consortium the members of the organizing team and of the technical team most importantly we are uh, we owe each one of you dear attendees um a deep sense of gratitude for taking an interest in our event and for staying with us right up to the end do not forget to fill that uh, feedback form we will send you your certificate as soon as we have received them and so that's it for now if you would like us to do anything else any um, another webinar on any other topic you can put it on the chat box we will take a look at them and the organizing team can come together and decide on another webinar in the future well so much for now thank you um uh, many thanks god bless ever more better ever jai hind yes well done well done beautiful oh, i was i was amazed at you